and I look. Thank you for coming out on um, such a dreadfully cold evening. Um, although it's an, it's a nice winter's evening in Armadale, and I guess Armadaleans know what it's like anyway. So you just put your scarf on and your hat and you come out. Um, but I think also I have to welcome some out of towners as well. Have we got any OEH people here that have come over from dinner? There's an OEH conference going on and I, I've been trying to convince them to come over. They're, they're at dinner at the White Bull, so if they can get up and come over, that, that might be great. But welcome to for familiar faces and non-familiar faces. It's great to see you here. This is our second event for this year in the, Nor uh, the New England Northwest Regional Science Hub Science in the Club series. And we're really aiming to bring scientific topics into a nice informal pub atmosphere and I guess bring, uh, bring science out of UNE and out of universities and into a kind of a social discussion and a fun one at that. So our first one uh, was in May and we had agriculture in a changing climate. We had a great turnout actually and the, and the, the fallout from that is a, you guys are here which is fantastic and some really nice ongoing discussions with Tony Windsor at that least, but with the panel members and the audience members about agriculture into the future. And in fact, we had audience members who have um, engaged with the university about agricultural degrees and there's been really robust conversations since that. So that's been a fantastic outcome. Tonight, we're talking about paradigm shifts. And I'm, I'm kind of a bit intimidated. I taught about par paradigm shifts at Monash University for probably about eight years, but I kind of get the feeling from the discussions I've had with you already um, that a lot of you uh, have some great knowledge and interest in the history and philosophy of science, maybe, um, and paradigms across economics uh, and other disciplines, including science. So I'm looking forward to the questions that are going to come and the discussions that we'll have. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce just even the concept um, of a paradigm. And really, a paradigm is just the way we see the world. In fact, every individual in this room could have could really live their life through a different paradigm or lens, if you like. It's our, it's our own reality. It's a set of assumptions, a set of values and data, if you're a, a technical or scientific thinking person, that underlies the way we see things. And in science, what that means is there's a group of people in a particular discipline or who study something who have a shared understanding or shared set of values and assumptions and knowledge about a particular thing. And the interesting thing about paradigms is, and, and shift, is that they shift all the time, but we're talking about big fundamental changes. So we're talking about not normal science, but revolutions in science. And something that underpins our discussion tonight is in 1969, uh, Thomas Kuhn published a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And this is four or five hundred years after another scientific revolution between the Aristotle way of thinking and moving through Francis Bacon's introduction of deductive reasoning in the scientific process, Thomas Kuhn introduced the idea that a scientific revolution is throwing away the old puzzle of an idea. So normal science happens regularly. The normal science is what happens all the time. Science builds on itself incrementally. You're doing a puzzle of the African savanna or something like that, or quantum physics. And as you put puzzle pieces in, you build a picture, you build an understanding of what you're studying. But there are gaps, there are always gaps, there's always anomalies, there's always these outliers. And those outliers are what is interesting. Those outliers are what causes you to say, this is not the African savanna, this is like the Eiffel Tower. Throw that away, let's start again. Let's get the new box, let's start a new paradigm, a new puzzle. And then our normal science just continues again till we start a new picture. And that's the kind of concept that we're talking about tonight. And in history, there's been some marvellous paradigm shifts, which has shifted society's entire way of thinking. And I'm not going to talk about those because tonight we have two fantastic people to help us discuss these things. We have Dr. Stephen Bosey from UNE. He's a physicist, but he also works in solar energy and um, medicinal medicine, physics, medicinal? Med medical, medical. medical physics. So you can talk to Stephen about that later too because there's some fascinating details in that. We also have adjunct professor Tony Sorensen who, who actually qualified as a um, geographer, um, is a futurist and has a, a real interest in the rate of change now. And you might be thinking right now, well, our world is constantly changing. It's changing more and more rapidly every day and paradigm shifts are coming fast. I'm going to hand over to Stephen. Both these 
brilliant thinkers are going to give us a bit of a presentation to start our cogs working, the questions flowing, and then we'll have discussions after that, including everyone. Stephen. Well, I don't know about brilliant, but uh, <coughs> I hope at least mildly amusing. Um, all right, uh, slides, please. Are we ready? Okay. Uh, that's a picture of my laboratory at, uh, at work. Now, I basically worked in several areas. Uh, I did my PhD in superconductivity. I then spent uh, roughly a decade working on solar and renewable energy. I did a little bit of work on plasmas, you know, the you know, gl glowing gases that make neutrons. But most of my recent work uh, has been in medical physics, which is uh, involved with medical imaging or using radiation to detect or, or treat cancer. Now let's uh, define a few terms. Uh, I'm a physicist, I have to define stuff. So what, what is logic? Logic is a set of formalised rules of deduction. Okay? And in that I'm just going to include mathematics as well. Anything, anything deductive I'm going to call logic. And the, the beauty of, of logic is that if you start with a bunch of true hypotheses, and then you draw conclusions using the formalised rules of logic, you can be guaranteed that your conclusions are true. Fantastic. The problem is that in real life, you very rarely have a complete set of true hypotheses. There's always something missing or some assumption in there isn't quite right or completely wrong. So you're never really guaranteed that your conclusions, no matter how logical you are, you've no guarantee that your conclusion is actually going to be the truth. Okay? So... That's why, as scientists, we need experiments to test the validity of our theories or the, uh, the truth of, of our hypotheses. So you do your experiment, you discover, ah, I've got to replace my hypothesis, it's wrong. So what do you do? Unfortunately, as beautiful and, 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 and reliable as logic is, logic on its own cannot generate new hypotheses. So as scientists, we have to rely on our creativity. And, and our, if anyone... If, 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 a, if a writer or a poet or a painter or a sculptor ever tells you that they're more creative than scientists, tell them that I told you that's crap, okay? <laughs> scientists are as creative as people in the arts because we've got to be creative to come up with new hypotheses. Uh, because, our, you know, these logic will not, not make new hypotheses for us. So... How do we do it? I've got, I'm going to suggest three ways. There are probably more, but these are the three that I had. That I, I didn't want this uh, talk to go too long, so I've, I've cut it down to three. The first one is analogy. Okay, so what you do is you say, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand this thing over here. It reminds me a little bit of some other problem over there. So I'm going to use this, the same laws that I tried on that system. I'll try it over here and see if it works. And this is what Newton did when he was trying to understand the motion of the planets, OK? There used to be, you know, in medieval times and earlier, there was, you know, the motions of the planets was this complicated clockwork. There was no real rationale for why it was. So what Newton said is that I'm going to assume that planets orbit around the sun using the same laws that Galileo derived for the motion of cannonballs. And, and, in fact, there's a picture out of his Principia Mathematica where he, he imagines, it's a you know, thought, thought experiment, where he imagines a, a cannon on top of a mountain and then you fire the cannonball and then gradually you increase the velocity of that cannonball until it, it orbits the Earth. Anyway, so he went through this kind of process, but using a lot of complicated mathematics, some of which he invented, called calculus. Uh, and he came up with the law of gravity and the laws of mechanics that was the mainstay of physics for the next three or four centuries. Um, then there's the, the other approach, which is the, the uh, uh, crime scene investigation crammed whiteboard method. <laughs> yeah, basically, you get a big whiteboard and you write all the evidence on the whiteboard and you start moving things around and drawing lines between them until you find a pattern. And this is how Mendeleev managed to create the periodic table of elements. What he did was, he was a very good chemist and he just got a whole lot of little pieces of card and on them he wrote the name of each element and he wrote down all of the, the properties of that element that he could think of. And then he would just shuffle them and move them around and rearrange them and try to put them into shapes until he found a pattern. And the pattern that he found eventually became what we now know as the periodic table of chemical elements. And then finally, if those two methods don't work, then try something stupid. <laughs> OK? So let me try to convince you that stupid ideas are, are actually useful. Okay, so 
So what, 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 what can stupid ideas do for us? Well, firstly, a stupid idea is a bit like a genetic mutation, okay? Evolution wouldn't happen. You wouldn't have complex beasts if you didn't have mutations that changing things. Okay, so, so a, a stupid idea can be like a genetic mu mutation and it can move you in an unexpected direction. It can cause your ideas to evolve in a totally unexpected way. Uh, a stupid idea can collect, connect previously unconnected ideas or a stupid idea could be an intermediate step to a better idea. Okay, the, that, that hula hoop model of the atom, if I asked you all to draw a picture of an atom on it, on that coaster in front of you, I bet that 90% of you would draw a little nucleus with hula hoops around it, with, being electron orbits. Well, that's 100 years old, that atom. But Bohr took that very simple and, and very deficient model of the atom, but by doing calculations based on that, he came up with a whole, a whole bunch of ideas that eventually led to quantum mechanics that gave us the modern picture of the atom. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some examples of some stupid ideas and, and, um, and why they were stupid and, and why they were right. So, a little over 100 years ago, the high tech of the day was the incandescent light bulb. People were trying to, to make them more efficient because if you stand next to one of them, they give a lot of, off a lot of radiant heat and there's only a very small percentage of the energy is actually light, so you're wasting a lot of energy. And it's been known for, for, for centuries, well, you know, millennia, that if you heat things up, they start off red hot. If you make them hotter, they go orange hot and then yellow hot. And then if you go really, really hot, they go white hot. And if you've got something like an arc welder where you get super, super hot, you get blue hot. But nobody really knew why you get this colour change. Nobody could give a scientific explanation for that colour change. So along, uh, now, part of the problem was that at the late 19th century, everybody knew light is a wave. That was proven undeniably by, with a series of experiments. And waves have the, you know, that kind of wave would have the property that the energy from those waves would be absorbed or emitted by things in dribs and drabs, you know, a bit like water being sucked into a sponge, you know, gradually in, in, in dribs and drabs. Uh, but if you did a calculation making that assumption, you got the wrong coloured spectrum. In fact, you would predict a spectrum that has an infinite amount of very, very high frequency light, which is clearly ridiculous because, you know, that's an infinite amount of energy out of something finite. So that was wrong. So then along came uh, Max, Max Planck, a uh, German physicist, and he changed, changed things. What he did was he said he made the assumption that the light energy, instead of being absorbed in dribs and drabs like a sponge, he said that light was absorbed and emitted in spoonfuls or in chunks called, that he called quanta. And when he made that assumption, he did the calculation, he got the right answer for the colours of hot objects. And he got the Nobel Prize as well, you know, as, as icing. Uh, but he had no idea why things, the energy was em emitted and absorbed in chunks. Then, a, a short time later, along comes a young not so young in that picture, but a young 25-year-old young, uh, scientist called Albert Einstein. And he was trying to explain another phenomenon called the photoelectric effect. If you shine the light onto metals, electrons come out. You get electricity coming out, right? And he was trying to explain it. So what he was, he took Planck's idea of these quanta and he interpreted it literally. He said not only is the energy absorbed in chunks or emitted in chunks, mm -hmm. he said that light's actually made of chunks, which we now call photons. So light was made of particles. That's totally crazy because... We already knew light was waves. How could something be waves and particles at the same time? It, it was inconsistent with, with the thinking of the day. But Einstein said it can be both. Depends on what you're doing at the time. And he correctly explained things and also kicked off quantum mechanics, which is basically the basis every time you click anything, any time anything's shining, any time you've got a computer, your watch, your phone, that's all because of quantum mechanics. So, however... Planck was quite embarrassed that Einstein, this, this young, young guy, had, had interpreted his quanta in this, this clearly ridiculous way that light's made of <coughs> particles. So much so that um, when Planck was writing a letter of recommendation so that Einstein could join the, the Prussian Academy of Science, he said, look, his hypothesis of light quanta cannot be really held too much against him for it is not possible to introduce really new ideas without taking a risk. So what he was saying is, look, this guy's clever, let him join the academy, but just ignore the fact that he said some silly things about light particles. I wish I was that stupid, he got a Nobel Prize for that. 
Okay, now we're going to talk about somebody else stupid, not Guglielmo, but Guglielmo Marconi, okay? In Italian, G L I E is ye. Okay, Got, now that's out of the way. Uh, now, what Guglielmo Marconi was trying to do is trying to make radio transmissions across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, you all know, I guess by now, I hope, and, and, and most of you believe, that the Earth is round. And because the Earth is round, the physicists said, don't be stupid. Radio waves travel in straight lines just like light. And therefore, if you try to transmit radio waves across the Atlantic, they're going to go off into space. But Marconi said, bugger you, I'm going to try the experiment anyway, even though it's stupid. And it worked. He managed to transmit radio signals across, across the Atlantic Ocean. And because he tried it, somebody had to explain why it worked. Okay, there was nothing wrong with what the physicist said. It's true, radio waves do travel in straight lines. But it worked. So why did it work? Along came a self-trained engineer called Oliver Heaviside and he explained the successful stupid experiment by postulating that above the Earth's atmosphere is a layer called the ionosphere that reflects radio waves. Okay, it's a bit, little bit conductive, you know, the, this is being bomb the air is being bombarded by sunlight, so it's a little bit conductive, it's, you know, it's ionised, for those in the audience who know what I mean, and that causes the, the radio waves to, to reflect off the ionosphere and then, and then bounce back over to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, another, another idiot, um, who, who, who get, you, uh, my, the next speaker will say a little bit more about this fellow, a fellow called Alfred Wegener. In 1912, he, he noticed that if you take the continents, you can fit them together like a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, it's a little trick. Try that trick at home, cut out a map, and you can, you can fit them all together in, like a jigsaw puzzle. And what he did was he then looked at the, the geology and the fossil record in the different con continents, and he found there was a continuous bands of certain fossils that spread across these, these um, continents that were very, very far away and separated by oceans. So how can you explain that you would have had the same animals living you know, across different continents unless they were originally stuck together? Now, Wegener was, a, uh, was only a, a, a meteorologist, so all the geologists said that he was an idiot. Okay? He said something really stupid. How can solid rock move like that? You know, obviously, don't let you know, outsiders like, like Wegener um, try, to, try to muscle in on our, uh, on our, our uh, discipline. And it was, wasn't until the 60s that when people did um, magnetic measurements of the seafloor, they found evidence that could only be explained that the seafloor was spreading apart in exactly the, the way that, that Alfred Wegener, would have, his theory would have required. And by then, Wegener was dead, so he never got to hear the good news, unfortunately. And of course, nowadays, GPS is so sensitive that you can actually measure continental drift directly. You know, just stand there with your GPS thing, you go, no, oh, it's another millimetre. Okay. And finally, the, the fellow who before was the young man being told he was an idiot becomes the old man telling the young man that he's an idiot. Okay? <laughs> In 1927, the, the, the Belgian priest Georges Lemaitre took Einstein's general relativity equations and he proved, theoretically at least, that the... Um, the, the universe must be expanding. And we now call that the Big Bang Theory, okay? <coughs> and now at the time, the physicists... Now, the idea that, that, that the universe was a, had a beginning and was expanding sort of appealed to, you know, a Catholic priest or any, anybody, you know, anybody who, who believed in, in a creation, but it didn't appeal to physicists. The physicists assumed that the universe must be eternal and, and static and steady. And in fact, Einstein said of, uh, of George Lemaitre, your, your maths is correct, but your physics is abominable. In other words, you, you didn't make any mistakes in the maths, but your interpretation is clearly crazy. And then another famous physicist at the time, Fred Hoyle, said the idea that the universe had a beginning is pseudoscience. Well, of course, now it's conventional science. And just two years later, the astronomer Hubble then observed evidence that the universe is indeed expanding. So he confirmed uh, what George Lemaitre predicted by, um, by theory, using Einstein's own equations. Okay, so just to prove you, I'm actually on message, I'm talking about <laughs> paradigm shifts, okay? I haven't mentioned it yet. So what's a paradigm shift? Well, a paradigm shift is an unexpected idea or philosophical underpinning that radically changes our view of the universe, okay? 
And I've those, some of those examples, like, well, those examples I gave you are, are examples of those. And because it's radical and unexpected, it sometimes seems stupid. And in fact, Stephen, can I interrupt there and say it's often seen stupid because it's usually proposed by people in their 20s who are often seen as stupid. Yes, right. yes, it's a, yes I'm, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Don't just spoil the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do I have a message? Okay, I have a message and my message is mainly to the young people. There's not, a, not that many very, very young people here but there are a few youngish people. Okay, what's my point? Firstly, not every step to the truth needs to be strictly correct. Okay? As, as I showed you, some of those examples are a little bit wrong, you know, like the development of our mo model of the atom but they still pointed in the right direction. Sometimes stupid experiments reveal new phenomena. So sometimes you've got to do an experiment even though you think, well, you know, I don't think this probably won't work. And my message to young people is everyone expects you to make mistakes. So take an intellectual risk and think new thoughts now, even if, if, they, even if they seem a bit stupid, okay? And another, another point is, Lucky for retired scientists because they don't have to, anything to prove anymore. So they can afford to take more risks intellectually. In fact, I know some retired scientists that started working on stuff that had they done it 20 years earlier, they would have been laughed at. But good thing that they did it. Okay, but I need to cover my ass legally, okay? I'm not asking you to do anything dangerous, okay? I'm talking about intellectual risks. Don't go along to a dance party and say, look, you know, this, this rather strange looking coloured pill, I'm going to try that because Steve said try something stupid. No, I'm talking about intellectual risks. Second, most stupid ideas really are that. They're stupid. So test them. You need to test your stupid ideas and that, that's the hard bit. Okay, that's the weather. All the work goes in. The creative spark is here. Oops. The creative spark is there but, but the hard work is testing them. Thirdly, stupid ideas allow us to think in new ways but if you're not careful, they can also predispose us to strange beliefs, okay? So, you know, a lot of people whose minds are so open their brain falls out, okay? <laughs> Got to watch out for that one. Another, another warning is stupid ideas don't get research grants. So if you're like a, you know, respectable, you know, mid-career uh, uh, scientist like me, don't, don't talk about your stupid ideas until you're really, really sure. You know, don't talk about them in public until you really, really know they're right. <laughs> okay. And finally, if you're retired, be careful because stupid ideas will sometimes be <laughs> interpreted as senility and I've certainly seen examples of, of, of people being interpreted that way. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. While the questions are fresh in your mind, does anyone have a question for Stephen before we hand over to Tony? Oh, good question. That, that's a very good question, and um, I, I'm 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 a uh, because I'm a scientist, and we tend to be we tend to be strict realists. I'd say that uh, that's our our picture of the universe has changed. But in some in some way, we're all parts of the universe as well. Okay, and if you like, each intelligence is a way of the universe looking at itself. So I guess if, if our picture of the universe changes, in some sense the universe has changed. And, on, and then, so that's an immediate consequence of, of a paradigm shift. But a longer term paradigm shift is obviously once you've got this new knowledge, it unleashes power that allows you to do stuff you couldn't do before. You know, all of a sudden you, you, you're able to build a bridges or you're able to send rockets to the moon. And all of a sudden there are, there are real life consequences of this change of ideas. Things that, in theory, there's no reason why somebody 100 years ago couldn't have tried, but they, but, but they just wasn't, the, the whole world wasn't set up. But now that, the, now that the, the, there's this new idea, all of a sudden things become possible. So in some sense, yeah, the whole universe does change. And in fact, that's a fantastic segue into Duck Rabbit. Um, Ian, can you go back to Duck Rabbit for me, because I didn't bring this up at the beginning. Um, can you, show of hands, who's seen this image? Right. <laughs> so you, you should have said duck rabbit. Yeah, I know. Rabbit duck. <laughs> <laughs> We're on rabbit duck. Who here sees a duck? 
Who here sees a rabbit? The statistics are perfect. It's the general population, it's about a 50-50 split on this. This is a fantastic example of what Stephen just talked about actually and what Roy just brought up. This is exactly the same information, just interpreted in two different ways. So if the universe has changed, yes, it does change. It changes in your mind, which is indeed the universe in itself, right? So it's a duck and it's a rabbit and it's neither of those. It's a whole set of scribbles on a page. So our interpretation and our perception of our reality or the paradigm is completely different depending on context and a whole heap of other underlining You're knowledge. You one of the questions. Right. Who, who sees a macadamia nap? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's the outlier. Excellent. Thank you. That's the interesting part. All right, I'm going to hand over to Tony. So, oh, sorry, we have a question at the back first. To what degree do paradigm shifts require the failures of the old paradigm as opposed to you're talking about new ideas coming out and that's good, that's important. But does the old paradigm have to be failing well, in order for there to be a paradigm shift? I guess, I guess the, the seed, you know, the, the, the new idea that should bring about the paradigm shift, that can happen any time. You, you look at, you, look at um, you know, people were talking about the sun being at the centre of the cosmos long before it became accepted orthodoxy. You know, that back in ancient Greek times, they're already talking about it. But there was no need to invoke it because there was no overwhelming evidence that the other picture was wrong at that stage. So you can, you can propose an idea well before your time, but it's only when the whole system is just really conscious of its failures that, this, that, that, that why, you know, it becomes widespread to start considering this new idea, I guess. Okay, thanks. Mm. Oh, just another one, Steve. Yeah, going back to um, uh, what the fellow down here said before. Yeah. Um, okay, so when the paradigm shifts, does the universe shift? Well, we don't have to be followers of Bishop Barclay to, 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 to look at ways in which that might actually happen, absolute idealism, that is, but to yeah. look at ways in which that really does happen. I'm very interested in the use and abuse of metaphor in, in, in science, and one... One, one's struck by the sort of um, reciprocal nature of metaphor. Yeah. Uh, and that is, I mean, if, if, if you look at the sort of things that were around that inspired uh, Darwin's, I'm a biologist, Darwin's uh, theories um, yeah. and, and uh, theory of natural selection, they fitted right into Victorian um, uh, robber baron capitalism as it was occupied and, and presumed at the time. Yeah. Now, that fed back into society in that way an unintentional consequence, I might add. Darwin never really wanted that to happen, yeah. but um, but it did. And uh, and things have moved on a lot in biology now. I mean, in terms of um, just simply in terms of the metaphor, the the metaphor of um, of, of selection through um, through relentless competition yeah. has sort of gone a little bit toward the notion of the formation of consortia and the formation of higher organisms. So, you know, that's a, that's a different idea and that sort of changes things too. It's also a different metaphor and it leads on to different sort of notions within society. Yeah. And I think that's a very interesting concept, that reciprocal nature, where the metaphors are derived from society but feed back into society and change society oh, in sure. that manner. Yeah. Um, my comment about that is... Um, the, the metaphor doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. No? Yeah. Yeah, it never is. Mm. yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And utility is where it's at when you're building on knowledge, really. Yeah. All right, I'm going to hand over to Tony for his presentation. Well, uh, these dudes here on the uh, screen right now are the kinds of people we've been talking about so far. Uh, these are people whose ideas have, in fact, been game changing. They have. Oh, sorry, I'm not talking into their microphone, but uh, normally people think my voice is loud enough anyway. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, well, Newton, Einstein, Heisenberg, uh, in terms of quantum mechanics, Copernicus, uh, Darwin, and so forth, were, their names have all come up before. And uh, their um, insights into the scientific world proved um, to be correct, major advances, and in the process, of course, um, their ideas uh, superseded what went before. 
Um, but I would like to also point out, of course, that uh, uh, their, their work was some kind, sometimes um, sort of earth-shattering in a way. Copernicus and Newton, between them, took huge strides towards explaining how this jumble of rocks which we see out there and uh, the gas between them is structured and uh, held together. And I think that um, these paradigm shifts are very often extremely exciting. And we've already gone through this too, um, the um, uh, Wegener's idea about uh, continental um, drift um, proved to be, in fact, uh, uh, pretty well spot on. In fact, Tony, can you tell us your experience of being at school and university while this oh, debate okay, was yes, raging? Okay, yes, I, I, I didn't do a pocket because bio myself. No, right, well, you, you were with, right uh, there when the paradigm was shifting. <laughs> I, I, I could just simply say that um, uh, I'm an interdisciplinary nomad, actually. I've uh, published on the fringes of um, economics, um, things like urban planning, sociology, uh, political science, and I often use scientific metaphor metaphors in my work. In fact, I managed to um, write a paper once on uh, the relevance of quantum mechanics to economics, um, <laughs> something that some people might find a little bit far-fetched. <laughs> um, but, um, in fact, uh, uh, as a result of perhaps this interdisciplinary movement, I'm also uh, now a futurist and I spend a lot of my time trying to imagine what the world will be looking like 25 years from now. Um, and what I'm seeing is in fact uh, something that is um, truly revolutionary. In other words, you can have um, uh, paradigm shifts going forward <laughs> and uh, I'm anti anticipating a whole lot of these and I'll come on to them in a minute. But in Interestingly, um, as someone who's also steeped in history, uh, I'm well aware that, and I'm coming on to this point now, um, it is human, uh, uh, paradigm shifts in human affairs, that is in political science, in uh, um, uh, philosophy, in uh, economics, uh, international trade and so forth, can in fact underpin uh, major advances in science. And in fact, um, I'm just about to uh, suggest to you that many of the periods of intense um, paradigm shift in science come on the back of other things that are occurring in society. So let's go on to this now, in fact. Uh, um, for example, um, in the golden age of Athens, uh, under Pericles in the 5th century BC, um, you had um, a very, very vibrant society uh, dealing in philosophy. Uh, they had a stable government. They had great commerce and trade throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. They had systems of education all in place. And it's my view that, in fact, um, these um, conditions, social, economic and political, were the preconditions for a lot of scientific advances. Um, I'd also observe, incidentally, that... Um, uh, it was, there's been a whole, uh, if you like, uh, well, 10 millennia of uh, paradigm shifts in, the, uh, hu in human affairs. For example, the discovery of agriculture led to the creation of sedentary societies, the creation of villages, and then ultimately cities. And human advances depended then, perhaps to some extent, on just something simple like... Um, working out that it was a good idea to keep cattle in fields and plant uh, uh, wheat or corn or whatever it was. Um, then came writing. Uh, in fact, nothing we do today would have been possible uh, without someone inventing the idea of, of writing. Writing is one of the... Uh, and, um, you know, putting uh, language down on not necessarily paper, it was stone or papyrus or whatever, um, was absolutely crucial for... Uh, storing ideas and having them on paper, then developing them further. And you could argue communicating paradigm shifts in science too, that language and, yes. and that ability to communicate that actually well, that is, that, that is another transported essential. ideas. Yes, it's another essential element of it. So um, the, the 5th century AD uh, saw a, a really good, giant leap forward, I think, in the way in which modern states were organised. 
Uh, the same thing happened in Venice um, in the start of the Renaissance, uh, in around about uh, uh, the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. Uh, and again, you had exactly the same sort of situation there. Uh, a stable state, a trading nation, um, uh, a, a, a nation that was steeped in culture and philosophy and so forth. And they um, reenacted what had happened in uh, Athens perhaps a thousand years earlier. And um, the Renaissance is, is associated indeed with an, a, another catapult forward in uh, scientific thinking. Um, and then again, um, in just a few uh, hundred years later on, uh, we got the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and I put this up here, um, Newcomen's uh, steam engine. In fact, uh, if you can call it that, well, it's an at atmospheric engine. It's not the first evidence of some people working with steam, but it was the first really workable uh, commercial operation. This uh, steam engine, incidentally, if you go to Camborne in Cornwall in England, is there. It's working. Uh, and it's actually World Heritage uh, listed simply because of its um, position at the start of the Industrial Revolution, which of course then was based on harnessing of steam and water power downstream. And uh, the next slide, um, I was here at Arkwright's Mill at Cromford in Derbyshire last year. And um, uh, it's a fascinating place. This is where effectively uh, the mass production of textiles started. And it had dramatic effect, not just on um, catapulting people's standards of living forward, but it actually rewrote the location of the textile industry in Britain. Previously in East Anglia, in Norwich, that was the capital of the textile industry. After Arkwright came along, it migrated to Manchester and um, Derbyshire and those kinds of places. Um, and then we go through a whole series of um, epochs. Um, we've got the first industrial revolution. There was a second industrial revolution um, for much of the 20th century based on the internal combustion engine and uh, various other uh, scientific leaps uh, forward. And by the way, in all of my presentation, I think we must recognize that scientific leaps are often intertwined with technological leaps. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so in other words, uh, it's actually coming up with technologies can beget science and vice versa. Oh. And the two of them are um, constantly intertwined. Um, and, uh, well, uh, one of the big things, of course, about science these days is it's, it's getting ever more expensive. And I happen to put up a, on here one of the most expensive pieces of uh, scientific equipment you'll ever likely to see. This uh, particular operation uh, uh, turned up the Higgs boson. Um, when was it? Two years ago now? Um, uh, no, it's, four, I think it's longer than that now, four or five. It, it's, it's five years. Mm. Yeah. Oh, is it? That, oh, gosh, sorry, I'd, I'd have to take that back. <laughs> Well, in fact, the stupid idea of the Higgs boson was actually is decades, in, if not centuries, old. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but but anyway, look, I'll, I'll just press on. Um, uh, okay. In the past, we had, the t as I said, the technologies of um, uh, writing and um, agriculture and all those kinds of things. Uh, nowadays, we're in the midst of a second um, bout of or third or fourth or whatever it is, uh, bout of uh, technological advance. Um, we're at the start of what has been termed um, the second machine age um, by a couple of researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, other people have called this the third industrial revolution. But whatever it is, um, we have here a conjunction of uh, highly innovative science mixing almost instantly with um, the advent of new um, technologies. Um, many of these you would have heard of, the Internet of Things, big data and its analysis, um, uh, greater computer, computing power, uh, there's quantum computing around the corner, I understand, which will dramatically increase the speed of computing. Um, 
artificial general intelligence and robotics and uh, various forms of expert systems. I've just read a book which is fascinating because um, it suggests that these kinds of expert systems are going to replace large numbers of doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, accountants. If you're thinking of going into any of these professions, you might want to think twice because they will be in great oversupply very shortly as a lot of these professional activities are, um, let's say, mechanised or automated in some sort of way. And I've even read a book which suggests that within five or ten years, robotic advocates will be addressing robotic judges. Um, so uh, that uh, is something you may not have come across. Look out, look out <laughs> for the lawyer buskers. <laughs> uh, there's al al alternative energies, uh, uh, but uh, particularly driverless vehicles. Um, oh, well, hang on, I'll just go on. Um, I'll, g I'll get on to driverless vehicles in a minute. Uh, I'll do 3D printers first. <laughs> um, 3D printers, how many people here have actually seen one in operation? There's quite a few hands here, but I guess it's less than 50%. But uh, 3D printers have so far been used for printing human organs for implanting in people. They've been uh, used for the creation of an aircraft jet engine. Um, they have been, uh, and this is an example of the jet engine there, um, what about uh, surgical implants? Uh, there is a 3D printed jaw that has actually been inserted in someone medically um, and made on a 3D printer. And uh, if you have, say, uh, you're a farmer and you've got a case tractor and uh, part brakes, if you've got a 3D printer in your garage, you can replace your, uh, that part almost instantly um, with one of these machines. It will uh, possibly revolutionise the world. And um, uh, the one I really love, though, is the, um, uh, the driverless vehicle. Um, I'm a frequent visitor to Silicon Valley, and there you can see driverless vehicles all around the streets, crawling around. Um, and um, I put this one up specifically because um, it is likely to be amongst the first in the world of a uh, driverless vehicle called a, uh, a pod, in effect it's a public transport, it's a bus, which will roam the streets of Greenwich and people will just get in and out of it uh, um, and there's no driver um, in this vehicle at all. My friends in Silicon Valley are suggesting to me that uh, these kinds of vehicles could remove something like two-thirds of all the vehicles on the road, which could have quite an impact on, uh, for example, firms making uh, automobiles, uh, and given that these vehicles don't crash as often as human-driven vehicles, in fact, only one of uh, Google's um, um, driverless cars has ever crashed, I think, as the result of the vehicle itself. Uh, all the other crashes have been caused by humans and human error. Um, can you imagine what it's like going to be like to be a panel beater? Yeah. <laughs> or... Um, what will insurance companies do once uh, premiums plummet because uh, uh, the p you're much less likely to have a crash? Can you see how um, a device like this can be uh, positively revolutionary? And if you add that to things like Uber and Lyft, those um, online uh, booking, car booking agencies, um, you, instead of real cars, um, and you combine it with, uh, well, Uber drivers are dispensed with, and you get Uber taxis with, with no one driving them. Um, well, the whole of sort of urban transport will be revolutionised. So at this so, point, Tony, can I suggest that uh, you're, you're actually alluding to, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the scientific paradigms and shifts in thinking and technologically, technology that's made these sorts of things available is now driving social paradigm shifts and societal paradigm shifts and yes. things like that? Absolutely. In, 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 in every way. I, I think that uh, society is going to be, um, if you like, almost shipwrecked in the next 20 years. Um, I have seen forecasts in the literature that something like 40% of all existing jobs will disappear within 20 years. 
And um, it's not just me who said that, because the, it was the Productivity Commission and Treasury who have also taken up on that particular figure, um, which means to say that um, we will have huge occupational shifts just shortly down the track that uh, will remake society. I would like to point out, though, that in all of the technological revolutions we've seen so far, uh, the number of jobs created has, if anything, exceeded the number of jobs lost. But the big problem is that they're not in the same places. In other words, if let's just take Armadale. If Armadale is unable to uh, generate the new types of um, jobs that are required, um, then um, it, as a community, could well be wrecked. Um, but those jobs, uh, I think, uh, lie in the kinds of things that I've been talking about. You know, there are people who will sell 3D printers or sell driverless cars. They will have to be maintained. They will have to be produced in some way. Um, so you can see where I'm coming from. Jobs will uh, arise, but they will be very different and society will be transformed in the process. And can I just say n another thing? Uh, Medical technologies um, are becoming so advanced that I have actually seen written down on paper a prediction that there is already someone alive who will live to the age of 1,000. Really? Uh, no, I read some what of sort of prediction? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been involved in cryonics and um, and long, you know, longevity and the desire for people to live radically extended life since um, I was at, um, I did my um, honours in zoology in ANU in the 1970s. And it has been um, an astonishing problem to me that this is not actually being addressed except in a rather covert way. I mean, for example, um, the lady, the Australian who won the Nobel Prize um, Elizabeth Blackburn that for, right, telomeres. for telomeres. Here, it was largely reported that it would help cure cancer. Well, uh, the way to cure cancer is to get rid of all the cardiologists. So it you're talking about protected. social paradigms here because you, you, you're so. arguing that the scientific paradigm and, and the Quite knowledge and the understanding so. exists already. I don't yeah. see any scientific barrier to radically extending human life. But I hear every second person say, we will always have death and taxes. Well, hang on. Truth doesn't arrive through the repetition of a silly phrase. <laughs> you know. And that seems to me a lot of the way academics and social commentaries work in this country. OK, so I will throw that to Tony okay. to address that social change as opposed to the scientific and technological one. Yeah. Um. Well, uh, there's a number of ways of answering this question. In, in, in actual fact, um, back in, uh, I think it was 1884, when the first uh, pension scheme was introduced on this planet by Otto von Bismarck, um, the average um, age of death of a male uh, was 71. And it was because of that that... Um, uh, Otto von Bismarck asked his treasurer, how can I reward um, the people who uh, were soldiers who helped to reunify Germany by giving them a reward in their uh, final years? And the treasury came back and said, um, well, in actual fact, uh, we've got enough money in the kitty to set the pension age at 67. And... It was in uh, 1912 that the uh, Germans reduced that to 65, and that became the gold standard, if you like, for all subsequent um, pension schemes. But going forward, um, one of my grandchildren, when she was born um, five years ago, um, the doctor opined that she had an average life expectancy of 95. Uh, and um, what has happened, of course, over that period is that medical science has got better and better and better, um, and in a way has created uh, this paradigm shift. But we're actually on the cusp now of, and I've read this in many different locations, cures for cancer. They're just over the horizon. And if uh, these cures come in, uh, forget about the morals and the ethics of this 
uh, situation, the reality is that people prefer or very often to live long if the quality of life is good. Um, and well, the, the perfect it's example kind of being the, the contraceptive pill. <laughs> Before 1960, there was, you know, it would be a, a long-winded ethical discussion about, about it. And then once the pill was actually there, people started using it, you know, and <laughs> forget the discussion. Yes. A cure for cancer is a Band-Aid. A cure for Alzheimer's is Band-Aid. It's being applied to an ageing organism. What I propose is a fundamental attack on ageing itself so that we live healthy, long, productive lives indefinitely. What is wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. There's a lot of research being done in that. Uh, now there is, but you still hear a lot of um, the majority of people saying, I wouldn't want to live for that length of time, or it's immoral, or death is natural. It is still, it's that's still that's in society. The so social paradigm actually hasn't occurred. And that's true. So social paradigms will inevitably follow. In fact, I'm going to bring back, back down to looking at historical and traditional paradigms. And Steve, when Galileo was proposing that the helio, that the sun was well, the centre of the universe, it was a stupid idea. And he was forced to get on his knees and to swear on the Bible that he didn't actually believe in the things that he'd proposed. It was an absolute atrocity. And it was hundreds of years before people actually believed this. And maybe... Well, outside no, no, the Inquisition, it was they were hundreds of years. It, well, it, was a, it was a long while before you could admit publicly that you believed it. That's right. But I, my question to you is: What sort of social change, or what sort of attitudinal change, happened because of understanding the sun was the centre <laughs> of the universe instead of the Earth? D did that make a huge difference to how we were in society, to how people thought? Uh, okay. Um, before. Before that, there was this idea that there was Earth, and Earth was grubby and 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 uh, and imperfect, and then there were the heavens, and the heavens were perfect, and so we were always trying to live our lives so that it was in, in commensurate with the laws of, of the heavens. Okay, once that once it was shown that that the so-called heavens were just as imperfect and pockmarked and crater-ridden. As, as it is down here, that, that shook the authority of the people, shook the authority of the people who were saying that, you know, you're all grubby and, 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 and unreliable people, you should be more like the beings up there. And all of a sudden the beings up there were just a bunch of rocks like down here. So in that sense, it, it shook the, the philosophical authority of the people who were using that as an argument. But not only that, by... Once Newton was able to take those um, orbits, you know, the laws that Kepler had... had uh, once Ke Kepler had decided, no, 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 I'm not going to assume that... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to assume that everything's orbiting the sun. Now I'm going to measure accurately the, the, the paths of the, the planets around the sun. Then Newton took those paths, took his... took Galileo's mechanics took invented some of his own mechanics took the invented the law of gravity and all of a sudden created a whole system for predicting the outcomes of 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 things of collisions of of, of things being fired out of cannons out of things flying up into space and it created a whole bunch of tools that all of a sudden made uh, and it uh, made it possible to do a whole bunch of engineering that before then it was not possible to do. Did so it also split society, though? And I guess I'm getting to those that thought we should still be in line with the heavens and well, still the, be perfect the, the and those that make the observations Well, talking about exactly that. you still got the people yeah. saying, we should, you know... At about that time, didn't Galileo say that this would be the death of Italian science because of the attitude of the church? to new knowledge. And I understand about then, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the artisans, the lens makers, the um, uh, people making intricate clockwork spread to the low countries into England and places like that who previously had a pretty poor technological um, abilities. And so that this, this caused um, the, these countries that were more receptive to scientific ideas to actually blossom and develop the technology needed to make the tools to do the experiments. 
in the in the tools and help. And in fact, I would yeah. say even before Galileo in 1620, when Francis Bacon published his Nova Organum, giving people those tools, the new tools, the new tools of of observation. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, which are the tools and the helps that, that came because of making those observations and wanting to test those observations. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I just come in with respect to the question over here? Uh, because and I think it does raise next. some hugely important issues. Um, there are some very, very large um, ethical and moral problems coming uh, as the results of machines, machine intelligence approaching the level of human intelligence. Uh, what point um, might it, uh, happen that uh, machines become cleverer than we are? And uh, how do we begin to organise society at that specific point? Ray Kurzweil, um, who you, some of you will have heard of, suggested that um, one way around this problem would be to um, reinforce people's intelligence by adding extra memory to the brain and etched extra processing power to the brain so that we become um, only perhaps half human, we become half human and half machine. So and that that's we another can, shift in itself. So, so that we can, um, you know, uh, compete with machines who might be uh, uh, able to take over running the world from us if we're not watching out carefully. Mm. Um, and th this is sitting there in the background, but it could become real within the next, say, 10 or 15 years. Addressing as living forever as well. Becomes very much more uh, profound. Mm. I'm going to throw a gentleman over here. Wait. So I'd just like to go, uh, to, to, to go on with, with that. I mean, um, people, after all, are still people regardless, and paradigm shifts and everything. That That's the, the world of the intellect, and, 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 and we tend to sort of assume, oh, well, Newton is the greatest um, physicist of them all, certainly the greatest of his day. But physics wasn't Newton's greatest love, I hope everyone oh, knows. Yeah, it was yeah. actually alchemy yeah. that was his greatest love, which is something that and, was complete And biblical bollocks, interpretation. Uh, complete <laughs> bollocks, according to um, the, the, the later on, the paradigm that followed that, which is the, you know, rational and, and ending up with maybe logical positivism or something a lot later, but, 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 but Newton was anything but that, in fact. So, so people are people and they have all sorts of interests and ideas and they cross-fertilise and, and, you know, one, and, and, and one can't really sort of generalise about a person. We tend to say, this is, th this is that person in the pantheon of science without thinking... He had these crazy ideas on, alkali uh, on, on, on alchemy and, 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 and biblical eschatology or whatever it was and, and all of that stuff. That was him as well. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I actually uh, got, to meet, got to meet one of my um, physics heroes, a Nobel Prize winner. I won't mention his name. I'm but uh, basically he was, he was working on... I was doing a PhD on something and when he was doing his PhD, he was working on that general area and he ended up, he was working on something that was distracting him from his PhD. You know, when we're supervising PhD students, we've we got to keep an eye on them, make sure they don't get too distracted. And he had won a Nobel Prize for something that was distracting him from his PhD. Anyway, <laughs> I got to meet this guy. <laughs> And part of the problem with getting a Nobel Prize is that once you've got one, no one will ever look you in the eye and say, you know, that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> and so he'd gone off on some wild tangent. Look, you know, I, I mean, I've said stupid ideas can sometimes be correct. Maybe he's right. But he, he, he'd gone off on this kind of hocus-pocus um, idea about, uh, you know, that... Anyway, whatever. I, he, he just flipped his nut. In <laughs> Um, so, yes, yes, you're right. Just because you, you create the new paradigm, just because you're one of the heroes of a field, it doesn't mean that at some point later you repudiate what you said before or you just downright, uh, 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 you know, it all falls apart. Yes, I agree, I agree. In a sense, it's, it's the whole edifice of our knowledge that's, 
that, that, that's what we're benefiting from. And, and, and in a sense, we're kind of privileged to be players in that. We might or might not be reliable players in that, but, uh, but in the end, it, 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 it's the edifice of all that that is the great, the great work. Not necessarily just the individual, although we like to celebrate the, the individual heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would like to uh, come in on that point you made. Um, one thing I could have said earlier, but I, I didn't, uh, because I wanted to open up this this discussion and not go on too long, is that um, very subtly, but very, I think, um, precisely on a, on a large um, scale, um, the way in which we relate to each other is in fact changing. Um, all, all these uh, social networking that we've got, for example, is ch uh, changing our, our lives in, in, in many different ways. Uh, but there are... Um, philosophers, um, thinkers out there who say that um, if we are to make the most of the uh, technological uh, maelstrom in, into which we are heading, um, what we've got to do as human beings is actually network very heavily with each other so that we uh, can actually, in a way, mutually support each other, but by um, talking with each other, we get new ideas about how to handle um, the kinds of threats that are emerging, uh, the revisions to our lifestyle that are emerging. But also it's been suggested that all of this networking is, in fact, simultaneously leveraging the future to arrive even faster. It is the um, synthesis of ideas uh, that is now driving a lot of science, is driving a lot of technology. Um, and in fact, most of the new technologies that come on stream um, involve many different sciences, uh, many different extra outside technologies. Um, and it's through all of this networking that these technologies are brought together to create, if you like, second and third round technologies. Um, I think a good example of this might be the, the, the idea of global positioning systems. You, you know what a global positioning system is, and originally it was de um, designed to tell you where you were, exactly where you were on the surface of the planet. Well, global positioning systems, if we take agriculture, have been hijacked um, by the likes of the smart farm, so that you put in uh, sensors all around in the ground to tell you what the soil moisture is, um, what the soil nutrients are, how your animals, you can attach a, uh, a monitor to the um, ear of a cow or whatever. Um, and huge amounts of data are being generated, which will then um, be uh, analysed in some sort of way and uh, lead towards a better um, husbandry down on the farm, one hopes. And, and, I, and I will actually say, just with this human element and what you're talking about too, yes, Tony, yes is that we won't necessarily know what the puzzle looks like on the other side. So paradigms and stupid ideas come up without knowing what the new knowledge is going to look like. So what the smart farm is doing and what these GPS systems are doing and what this big data is doing is creating the shift which is messy and which is complex. Yes. And in fact, I, uh, you know, listening to all this and kind of pulling together these ideas, you can also make the analogy of the sand pile, you know, that the, the grains of sand when you drop them in a pile, they pile up to form a cone shaped and there will be one grain of sand that causes the avalanche. And that critical point <laughs> in this complex system is possibly where all these, all the networks and, and all the, the, the social aspects of humans are sort of pointing to now is, is, is a critical point in that sand pile. And we won't know what the, look, the new pile will look like, the new paradigm in, in social stuff. Yeah, can, can I just... Partly contradict with something of what you're saying. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Please. Now, you're, you're saying that because of the high degree of, of connectivity, that that will increase the 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 you know the, the rate at which paradigm shifts occur. I agree that can increase the rate at which they dispersed. But actually, often these paradigm shifts, these crazy ideas, will come up by loners, the people that didn't really pay attention to what their colleagues were saying and that's why they were able to stomach the idea of the stupid idea whereas if you're too highly connected you already know that the idea is stupid 
So in a, in a sense, I suspect they still need that place for the disconnected person that doesn't give a damn what his or her colleagues think and prepared to think the unthinkable. So they drive but the scientific paradigm shift, but yeah. the connectivity drives the social shift. Oh, no, but even, no, but even with science, saying? once you, you do need the, the connectivity in order for the idea to propagate to throughout mm-hmm. the whole, uh, whether it's the scientific world or the world at large. But it's not, ne- it's not, I don't think it's always the most connected people that are coming up with the paradigm shifts. I think it's kind of like somebody with just a little bit of a. <laughs> You know, the crazy loner. You need. You still need the crazy loner that's prepared to think the unthinkable. Oh, look, I will, I, I'll agree to that. Uh, but it's, 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 um, ev- it was ever thus in, say, uh, yeah, yes, much of, of art, uh, for example. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, movements in art have always been pioneered by people who come out of nowhere yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and come up with uh, the people who don't your know crazy what's fashionable. ideas. Yes. The people who don't know what's fashionable, so they're not painting what's fashionable. <laughs> yeah. Or they're not singing what's fashionable, uh, or they're not I, thinking what's fashionable. I, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll concede that, but I will still uh, emphasise the idea that um, to navigate a very, very complex uh, and uncertain futures, we're probably going to have to hang together. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Most of us, n- most of us need to cooperate. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. But there's got to be room for that, you know, for, this, for that, for, for, for the that, crazy loner. For the crazy loner. And in fact, on that note, I'm going to propose a crazy idea that we um, have a stretch and grab a drink. And I'm going to put something in your mind. Is is Pastor's chance? favours the prepared mind and come back after five minutes or ten grabbing a drink and thinking about that, that actually a prepared mind can be the preparation for a crazy loner stupid idea. Yeah, yeah. Grab a drink everyone, come back in five, I'll give you a call.